this is a series that we're going to touch on and talk about politics, but I want to tell you right up front what this series is not. This is not a series where I will tell you who to vote for. This is not a series where I will bash or endorse a candidate. That's not what this series is about. So, so let me just ask you a question right up, up, up front here. You may love your political party and you may love your politicians, but does your politician actually know you? Like the person that you are very passionate about or maybe the person that causes you to lose sleep because you can't stand their policies or can't stand what they say, does that person actually know you? Let me ask you another question. Are they willing to die for you? I don't know a politician that's willing to lay down their life for my good, but Jesus did. Jesus did, and that's why I can say definitively that the lamb is greater than the donkey or the elephant. Are you willing to evaluate your politics through the filter of the Christian faith rather than create a faith that supports your politics? Here's the question, let me read it again, it's so important. Are you willing to evaluate your politics through the filter of the Christian faith rather than create a faith that supports your politics? So this is a series that we're going to touch on and talk about politics, but I want to tell you right up front what this series is not. This is not a series where I will tell you who to vote for. This is not a series where I will bash or endorse a candidate. That's not what this series is about. So, so let me just ask you a question right up, up, up front here. You may love your political party and you may love your politicians. But does your politician actually know you? Like the person that you are very passionate about or maybe the person that causes you to lose sleep because you can't stand their policies or can't stand what they say, does that person actually know you? Let me ask you another question. Are they willing to die for you? I don't know a politician that's willing to lay down their life for my good, but Jesus did. Jesus did, and that's why I can say definitively that the lamb is greater than the donkey or the elephant. Are you willing to evaluate your politics through the filter of the Christian faith rather than create a faith that supports your politics? Here's the question, let me read it again, it's so important. Are you willing to evaluate your politics through the filter of the Christian faith rather than create a faith that supports your politics. Happy Sunday, fam. We are going to have an incredible day together. If you are new to Next Level Online I've, and I've never gotten the opportunity to meet you before, my name is Eric. I'm one of the pastors here at Next Level. On behalf of the whole Next Level community, I want you to know that you are an honored guest. Throughout this experience, our host team is available for you in the chat if you have any questions. So be sure to say hello to them and everyone else that's gathered as well. 
And be sure to stick around to the very end of this experience because I'm going to tell you how you can score a free gift just for being a first time guest. Well, before we turn things over to our worship team, I wanted to take a moment and celebrate with you. During the month of August, we partnered with We Are The Echo with a goal of raising $2,500 in order to provide family fun kits for 25 foster families. Well, I'm happy to say that we met our goal. So give yourselves a hand. Give somebody a high five if you're in the room with them. If nobody's there, I guess you can just high five yourself. Um, Anyway, one of the things that I love about being a part of Next Level is that we get to make a difference throughout the year in conjunction with our strategic partners. So for the month of October, we are joining with our newest strategic partner, Tab Elementary School, for a book drive. We work with the teachers to put together a list of the books that they'd love to have for their classes, and now we have the opportunity to purchase those books. To participate, all you need to do is follow the link in the chat or visit our Make a Difference page on the website where you will find a link to the Amazon wish list. Once you purchase a book, it will be sent directly to the teacher to be used in their classroom. Well, I don't know about you, but I am ready to spend the next few moments worshiping God together. So let's turn up the volume and get ready to sing together.
thank you for this day and we thank you for this opportunity to worship your holy name. God, we ask that you would give us the courage to rely completely on you. We love you and we will forever give you praise. In Jesus' name, amen. I love when we get the opportunity to sing and place our attention on the greatness of God. And I'm sure you're wondering right now why I'm wearing this mask. Well, I do like dressing up and having fun, but I'm wearing this mask to help you remember two things that we have coming up at Next Level Church in the weeks to come. First, on October 25th, we're having Costume Sunday at Next Level Church Online. On that day, we'll have a special hashtag for you to use so that you can post your costume on social media, and we will be giving away prizes. If you choose to visit with us in person at 8.30, 10, or 11.30, we will have a photo booth set up for you. So start working on what cool costume you are planning to wear. Second, this costume I'm wearing is also from one of my favorite Christmas movies. And even though we haven't reached the Christmas season yet, Next Level is getting ready for our annual Christmas light show. If you're interested in being a part of prepping the lights, helping us get everything ready for the November launch of the light show, text the word Christmas to the number on the screen. Then someone will get back with you about your next steps. Well, in just a few minutes, you're gonna be hearing from our lead pastor as we continue in our teaching series, The Lamb is Greater Than the Donkey and the Elephant. No matter your political affiliation, I believe that we all have something to learn about how to keep Jesus first in the midst of this divisive political season. So would you join me in welcoming Pastor Rob? Hit those like buttons, your heart buttons, and let's get ready to hear from God. Today we are continuing our series entitled The Lamb is Greater Than the Donkey and the Elephant. And I want to try to say this every week in this series, uh, just to make sure that no one misses it. This is not a series where I'm going to tell you how to vote. 
This is not a series where we're going to bash on one of the candidates or either of the candidates. This is a series where I really want Christians to wrestle with this idea. It comes from Pastor Andy Stanley. Are you willing to evaluate your politics through the filter of the Christian faith rather than create a faith that supports your politics? Meaning, are you willing to have a Christian worldview more than a Republican or a Democrat or a libertarian worldview? Are you willing, if you love Jesus, if you follow Jesus, if you're a Christian, and if you're not a Christian, I think it's cool that you're checking out this series because you get to see what the heartbeat is. So often, Christians have gotten it wrong, especially when it comes to politics. And if you're not a Christian, then I love that you're tuning this in and you can check it out because I want you to share, I want you to hear the heartbeat behind what it means to be a Christian and to vote and be a part of politics. Uh, last week, I, I mentioned that I don't have a fat clue where we get the mascots for the Democrats and, and the Republicans. The Democrat mascot is the donkey. The Republican mascot is the elephant. And I did a little research this week to figure it out. Since the 19th century, the elephant has been the mascot for the Republican and the donkey has been the mascot for the Democrats. And it all started in 1828 when Andrew Jackson was running for pre president. His opponent called him a, a, a curse word. It's a, a name for, for donkey. The first word is Jack. The second word rhymes with sass. And instead of Andrew Jackson getting offended by it, he embraced it. And he said, this is the, the term. This is the donkey is the mascot of the common people. Andrew Jackson went on to win the election and he was the first Democratic president. And since then, the mascot, the animal associated with Democrats was, was the donkey. The Republican mascot of an elephant, it started during the Civil War. During the Civil War, the term elephant was given to mean fight bravely. And because Lincoln was the first Republican president, the elephant started to make appearances in comic strips. Uh, a famous cartoonist back in that day and age was named Thomas Nast, and he was a political cartoonist and a major supporter of Lincoln. One of his famous cartoons that he drew in, in the papers is going to come up on your screen right now. You'll see in it there are multiple animals, and all of these animals represented the various political factions in America to this day. And in that, he put an elephant, which was on the edge of the cliff, cliff looking like it was going to almost topple over. And uh, it says on it, the Republican vote. From that comic strip and others, it came to mean that the Republican's mascot was was the, the elephant. Now, interesting enough, uh, Nast, who created the, the, this comic strip and became very popular for his political cartoons, Nast is also the one credited with creating the modern-day image of Santa Claus. So that's a, a fun, fascinating fact. So that's how we get the mascots of the elephant and the donkey. And I shared last week how we get the lamb, that scripture teaches us that Jesus is the lamb of God, meaning that Jesus was born to die. He came willingly to sacrifice his life for us. That is, he took our place. He took our sin, that he wasn't forced on the cross. He willingly laid down his life and died. And his sacrifice then covers over our sins, that we have forgiveness because Jesus sacrificed himself. And therefore, Jesus is the lamb of God. So Jesus is the Lamb of God, and his mother's name is Mary. So I guess you could say Mary did have a little lamb. But um ching I'll be here all day. Today the question I want to answer is what do we do if the party we vote for wins? Last week we discussed how do we get along with people who vote differently than we do. And if you missed last week, I highly encourage you to watch the replay on demand on our Facebook page, or you can listen to the podcast at iTunes, also on our website, nextlevelchurch.net. But this week, the question that we're going to wrestle with is what do we do if the party we vote for wins? Okay, now you might be thinking, well, what do you mean, what do we do? We celebrate, right? We, we throw a party, like we rub it in the other team's face, like we got it, we won, four more years, yeah, that's all. Like, oh, so what do you do? What do you do, though? What do you do if your party wins? I want you, before you just think that we celebrate, I want you to, to go back with me four years ago. Four years ago, we were coming off uh, President Obama, who was in office for eight years, 
And at least in my lifetime, what has typically happened is when one party has a candidate that wins the, the re-election is in office for eight years, the following year, the other party, whoever their candidate is, ends up getting in office. So it was no surprise, at least to me, that after eight years of Obama, a Republican then would become the president. I've seen this happen multiple times in, in, in my lifetime. Because I am a person who is middle of the road, and because I'm, um, if you're familiar with Enneagram, I'm an Enneagram 9, that's the, the, the peacemaker, and I can see both sides of almost every coin, and I have friends who are Republicans, and I have friends who are Democrats, and because of that, I was able to see some interesting things. My mainly white Republican friends, especially those who were Christians, when Obama uh, was out of office and Donald Trump was elected, the Republican won, I saw a lot of celebrations, and the celebrations tagged on a line that talked about how evil the Democrat Party was. And it, so it wasn't just like, yeah, we're, we're so glad that the person we voted for won. It's like, yeah, we won, and the other side is evil. We're actually battling against evil with winning. We're going to celebrate. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. There's, there's some common things that I, I heard. The difficult thing is, is that I have friends on the other side who their candidate lost. And especially my minority friends, they were saying a very different story. And what they were saying four years ago is that I'm scared. I'm scared. Not I'm sad that my candidate lost or I'm sad that we no longer have a Democrat as president. What they were saying is, is that I, I, I'm afraid. I, I'm afraid for the future of, of the country. I'm afraid for what's going to happen. Now, stick with me on this, okay? I don't know if you responded one of those two ways, but I want to rewind now even more to eight years ago. Because eight years ago, President Obama was running for re-election. And what I heard that time from my Republican friends is, we're scared. We're scared for four more years of a Democrat in office. What I heard from my Democrat friends is, we're scared if, if Obama doesn't get re-elected. We feel safe if a Democrat wins again. And what I want to point out to you is that so much of what we vote for and who we vote for comes down to fear. In fact, the primary way that politicians motivate us is by using fear. I don't know if you watched the presidential debate from, from a couple weeks ago, but constantly throughout it, they both were yelling at each other or, or discussing very passionately fear tactics. If this guy wins, this is what it's going to do to our country. If that guy wins, this is what it's going to do to our country. Politicians peddle fear. Why? Because fear raises money. And you ever notice they raise a lot of money. Vote for me and I'll protect you. Vote for me and you'll feel safe. Don't vote for me and this is what's going to happen to our country. Fear is a powerful motivator, but it is a horrible master. And we as human beings, we're fearful creatures. And this is why we feel safer when our politician wins and we feel afraid when our politician loses. We, we feel like we've lost some safety or we've gained some safety. So Republicans are worried about what happens if the left or the Democrats win. And they're worried. They're afraid. What happens to our, our gun rights and what happens to religious freedom and what happens to some of the conservative values that we hold on to? And that's a real fear that, that you have. You feel more safe with those things when a Republican is, is in office. But the Democrat friends are worried well, what happens if a Democrat doesn't win? What, what happens to women's rights or to health care? What happens to minorities in America? Both sides are afraid. And so what I want, to, want you to do, and I, I want to make sure that you hear me on this. I'm not going to tell you who to vote for, but no matter who you vote for, what I'm asking you and encouraging you to do is to not allow fear to divide us. Because fear, we are falling for this hook, line, and sinker. And so if your party wins, I want to ask you to do something that is outside of your comfort zone. I want you to do something that you may have never thought of before. I want you to do something that may even feel stupid to you. What I want you to do is if your party wins, I want you to muster up some empathy and care. And I want you to care and show that you care for people who voted differently than you do. 
Why? Well, that takes us to our big idea for today. The big idea is the world isn't as scary when you have an army of love behind you. The world isn't as scary when you have an army of love behind you. The world is a scary place. And one of the reasons we become so passionate about politics is because we feel safer when the people we vote for win. Therefore, when the people we vote for lose, we feel unsafe. And the way to feel safe as a Christian is to not put our hope in who's in office, but to put our hope in Jesus and to stand together that the world, we can still live in a scary world, but it's not as scary when we have an army standing together, an army of love standing behind us. I, I, I want to, in order to do this, um, we're going to have to show a lot of empathy and we're going to need a lot of Jesus. And so to direct us, uh, we're going to get into our scripture. Our, our theme scripture, our main scripture for today is Philippians 128. And at Next Level, we honor the text by reading it nice and loud. So wherever you're watching this at, I encourage you to read this nice and loud. And when we get to the reference, Philippians 128, you'll see two dots between the 1 and 28. We like to have a little bit of fun and we like to say dot, dot. And so you're welcome to join us along in that. So will you read it with me nice and loud? It says, without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you, this is a sign to them that they will be destroyed, but that you will be saved. And that by God. Philippians 1, dot, dot, 28. Now that we've read the text, let's go to God in prayer. God, we come before you and we ask that you would speak to our hearts in a personal way that you would speak louder than our own personalities and our own filters and our own biases, and God, that you would speak louder than our fear. And that, God, we would be people who view our politics through the lens of following after you. And God, I ask that the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, you are my rock and my redeemer. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, I want to give you a little bit of context to what we just read. Philippians is Paul's letter to the Christians living in Philippi. And you can read about Paul's adventures in Philippi in Acts 16. We don't know for sure, but if you just base off Acts 16, it feels like the leadership of the church in Philippi is predominantly women. And that's an interesting thing about the church in in, in Philippi. Philippians is one of Paul's most encouraging letters. The church in Philippi cared about Paul greatly, and they sent him a gift basket, a gift package, while he was in chains in Rome. He was in prison simply for loving Jesus. He committed no crime. He did nothing wrong. He simply was preaching Jesus, and they didn't like it, and they threw him in prison. And the Philippians met his needs. And a common theme in a lot of Paul's letters, he addresses a ton of things, but a common theme is to be unified together as a church. And we're going to see this, and I think it applies so much to us in this political season. We're going to start with Philippians 2, 1 through 2. It starts off by saying, therefore, now I want to stop there just for a second. Anytime you're reading scripture and you come to the word therefore, you should ask yourself, what's it there for? And this is an incredibly important therefore, because in order for us to get what Paul says in Philippians 2, 1 through 2, we got to rewind a little bit. So if you'll rewind with me, we're going to go back to the very end of Philippians 1. In Philippians 1, 27, this is the therefore. Stick with me on this one. Paul writes, whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then whether I come to see you or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in the one spirit. Now there's some words underlined. Would you just read these words with me? Striving together as one for the faith of the gospel. Now this is a good word. This is an encouraging word. Paul says, whatever happens, whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner that is worthy of Jesus. Whatever happens. Did you know that you represent Jesus wherever you go? You do. Everywhere that you go, you represent Jesus. And this is incredibly important because you can tell a lot about a person when they don't get their way. If you want to see the heartbeat of a person, look how they react when they don't get their way. And Paul would say, no matter what happens, no matter if your politician wins or your politician loses, no matter what happens, conduct yourself in a manner worthy of the gospel. No matter what happens, if you get bad service at a restaurant, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy 
of the gospel. No matter what happens, if someone is rude to you online, conduct yourself in a manner worthy of the gospel. No matter what happens, if you get your way or you don't get your way, you represent Jesus. And I want to make sure that you hear this. This is not to be said so that you feel shame or that you feel like, oh, that's such a heavy burden. I can't carry this. This is supposed to be like a badge of honor. Like if you ever are around someone who served in our military, specifically someone like a Green Beret, they are a special group that have this bond. It's an honor for them to serve their country. They've done something together and being a Green Beret means something. It it, it directs how you conduct yourself. Uh, another example w- would come from, from college football. I'm not a huge college football fan, but I've seen enough movies and seen enough stories about Notre Dame's football team. And the Notre Dame tradition, because they have such a historic tradition, it means something to wear the helmet uh, of Notre Dame. It means something. You carry yourself in a specific way because of the team that you play for. And that's the same thing that happens with Jesus. If you are a Christian... You carry, you represent Jesus everywhere you go. Your reactions are not just about you. You are representing Jesus. So no matter what happens, whether you win or you lose, do everything in a manner worthy of Jesus. Now, the reason he says to do that is, or the way that he says to do that is that we come together as one. And the truth is, is that we are better together. We will be able to respond better when we know that someone else has our back. Let's keep reading to see what, what Paul says next in Philippians 1, 28 through 30. When we are one, when we are together, we are to do this without being, and there's an underlined word. Would you just read that word with me? Frightened in any way by those who oppose you. This is a sign to them that they will be destroyed, but that you will be saved and that by God. For it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for him, since you're going through the same struggle you saw I had now and here that I still have. Let me give you a little bit more, more context. Uh, Paul suffered when he was in Philippi. He had some great stories and had some great moments, but there was a time where he did something uh, for, for God and people reacted poorly. They reacted so poorly that they grabbed him up, they threw him in prison, and they beat him with rods. They beat him with rods. And then they throw, threw him in prison to rot. And God sent an angel and delivered him miraculously. He was able to escape prison, but it doesn't, it doesn't escape the fact that Paul had to suffer. Paul suffered. And Paul is telling the, the Philippians, he's in jail now. He's still suffering. And Paul's saying, listen, you may have to suffer at some point. You may have to suffer at some point for your faith in Jesus. Listen, I cannot promise you that America will always be here. I can't promise that we'll always have the religious freedom that we have. Being a Christian doesn't mean that you get every personal victory. Sometimes it looks like we're losing. Sometimes it looks like we're defeated. Sometimes we're Paul and we have the victories, and sometimes we're Paul and we're sitting in prison after we've been beat. And no matter what happens, Paul says, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel. And how do we do that? Well, we stand together without being frightened. We stand together. Why? Well, it takes us back to our big idea. The world isn't as scary when you have an army of love behind you. The world is a scary place, but it's a lot less scary when you know that people have your back. It's a lot less scary when someone says, hey, listen, I care about you, and I may not agree with you, but because I love you, I'm going to protect you. I'm going to support you. I'm going to try to meet your needs. Even when we disagree, I'm going to show you that I care. The world isn't as scary when you have an army of love behind you. Way too many Christians are acting like, my hope is built on nothing less than how I vote on politics. If we win, then I feel safe. But if we lose, I threaten to move to a safe place. On my candidate, I'll stand and I'll hate the other man. And I'll hate my fellow man. So many of us say that we're Christians, but we act like our hope is built on our politics. Our hope is not built on who is in the White House. If your candidate wins or loses, 
as a Christian, you don't have to fear because we still trust that Jesus is on the throne. And we can build each other's trust when we have each other's back and care about one another. What did Paul write? He said, without being, there's that word again, frightened in any way by those oppose you. Without being frightened. We don't have to be frightened. Why? Because our hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' love and righteousness. Our hope's not built on an elephant. Our hope's not built on a donkey. Our hope is built on Jesus. And together, we can be united. And when we're united, we don't have to be afraid because we stand together. Without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you, this is a sign to them that they will be destroyed, but that you will be saved, and that by God. How are we saved in the end? By God. So even if, even if they take our lives, we're still saved because our hope is not in this earth. Our hope is in Jesus. So now that we understand all of that, that's the therefore that we are to conduct ourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel, that we are to stand united as one, that we are to be so united that we are not to be afraid no matter what happens. We have each other's backs. Now that we understand that, let's get back to Philippians 2, 1 through 2. Paul says, Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from His love, if any common sharing in the Spirit, If any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being what? Like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and one mind. Now, now we know what the therefore is there for. When we have each other's backs, when we carry each other's burdens, when when we, we, we live our lives in a manner worthy of the gospel, when we support one another, when we say, hey, listen, I disagree with how you vote, but I still got your back. I care about you. If you're scared, I'm going to come to bat for you. If you're afraid, I'm going to do what I can to protect you. You may not have won this election, but you still have my friendship. When we support one another, we don't have to be afraid. And Paul says, make my joy complete by being like-minded. He doesn't mean that we agree upon everything. We're going to disagree on so many things. We're, we're going to disagree on, 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 like there's a million things that divide us. What we are like-minded on is Jesus. We're like-minded on our love for Jesus. So we're going to say, okay, we have differences and that's okay, but because of Jesus, we're going to have each other's backs. And to me, this section for Paul is like his movie speech. Have you ever seen like a, a movie where right before like a battle, they give this like war cry? It, it, it reminds me of, of Lord of the Rings Return of the King. In that movie, Aragon gives this speech right before battle. He can tell that everyone is afraid. And it reminds me of this political season because everyone is afraid. And we're looking at this election and we're thinking, if my candidate doesn't win, what's going to happen? I'm afraid. And listen to what Aragon says. I see in your eyes the same fear that would take heart of me. A day may come when the courage of men fails, when we forsake our friends and break all bonds of fellowship. But it is not this day, an hour of wolves and shattered shields when the age of men comes crashing down. But it is not this day. This day we fight. By all that you hold dear on this good earth, I bid you stand, men of the West. Man, that fires me up. A day may come when the courage of men fails. A day may come when the courage of Christians fails. A day may come when I feel so afraid that I can't stand on my own, but not today. 2020 may have taken a lot from us, but it will be known as the year where a group of Christians came together at Next Level Church to show our common love in Jesus. And the world may be divided, but we are going to stand together. So how do we do this? It's a great question. Thank you for asking. I think a great way that we do this comes from a quote by uh, author Philip Yancey. He says, politics draws lines between people. In contrast, Jesus' love cuts across those lines, and dispenses grace. That does not mean, of course, that Christians should not involve themselves in politics. It simply means that as we do so, we must not let the rules of power displace the common, the command to love. So how do we do this? How do we love our fellow Christians? Well, I am challenging and encouraging and trying to inspire you that the way that we love our fellow Christians is that if your candidate wins you reach across the aisle to someone you know who voted differently and you show them love. 
not rub it in their face, not say we got you, like literally think, put someone ahead of yourself. What would you like to happen if your candidate lost? How would you like the other side to treat you? What would make you feel safe if what you voted for didn't get into the White House? What would make you feel safe? Do that for the other side. Because fear is dividing us. And none of us is going to be our best selves as long as fear is ruling. You can serve God or you can serve fear, but you cannot serve both. So this day, let's just make a declaration. Fear's not going to win. Fear's not going to divide us. Politics is not going to divide us. That we are going to stand together as one. And you know what? I'm convinced that if Next Level can do this, if we can love each other and we can love each other well, despite race differences, despite political differences, despite gender differences, despite age differences, if we can learn to truly love one another, I'm convinced that someone, someone who doesn't go to church and someone who doesn't believe in Jesus, that someone's going to look at the way that we treat one another and say, wow, you guys love one another across political divides. I've never seen anything like that. How powerful would it be if in a day and age where fear is dividing us, we stood together unafraid because we had each other's back. And that takes us to today's win. Today's win is if your party wins, reach out to someone you love who voted for the other party and let them know. Let them know, I will do what I can to help make you feel safe. So here's one way that we can do this specifically. Paul said to show grace, and I want to encourage you. In this political season, when you go to church with someone who votes differently than you, instead of judging them, instead of getting upset with them, and instead of hiding them on Facebook or giving them a nasty comment, would you show them a little extra grace? And would you know that probably they're speaking so passionately about politics because they're afraid. Fear is the motivating thing that's dividing them. So instead of throwing it back in their face or showing how you're against them, would you try to reach across and say, hey, listen, I may disagree with you, but I love you. I got your back. And no matter what happens, I'll do my part to protect you. So if your party wins, I want to make sure that you hear this because in just a couple weeks, we're going to have an election and someone's going to win and someone's going to lose. So if your party wins, I'm asking you to reach out to someone you love who voted for the other party and let them know, I will do what I can to help make you feel safe. The world isn't as scary when you have an army of love behind you. Will you pray with me? God, we come before you and we ask that you would, God, help us to be people that don't just care about our own interests but that we care about the interests of others and that you would help us, God, to live out this this command from Paul, that you would help us to live out uh, our faith in a way that is a way that is worthy of the gospel. And we ask, God, that you would help us to love one another and support one another even when we disagree. And God, I ask that you would unite us together as a church so that the rest of the world would look on and would scratch their heads and say, I don't have a fat clue how they get along, but because of Jesus, they do. And I ask God that you would do immeasurably more than we could ask or imagine. In Jesus' name, amen. I hope that today's message encouraged and challenged you. Thank you so much for making it a priority to gather with us today and each Sunday. If today was your first time joining us online, we'd like to give you a free gift when you choose to take the Stick for Three Challenge. Challenge is simple. Attend Next Level three times and see if we are a good fit for you. We think you'll be able to have a better idea about who we are as a church when you stick around for a little bit. If you want to stick for three, text the word welcome to the number on the screen. And as a thank you, we will send you a free gift. Also, if you've been blessed by today's service and the ministry of Next Level and would like to partner with us financially, you can give anytime during the week by visiting nextlevelchurch.net slash give or by texting Next Level Give to 77977. Finally, if you have any questions about Jesus and what it means to be a follower of Jesus, I'd love to talk with you about that this week. Text the word faith to the number on the screen and we will find a time to talk with one another. Well, until we meet each other again, I hope that you will boldly live out your faith. We'll see you right back here next Sunday.